Hey everybody, it's Christian Buckley doing another MVP Buzz Chat and talking today with Peter. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? It's actually an exciting day. I know that we're recording this. It goes live in a couple of weeks, but this is like the big day for MVPs, renewal day. We all just found out. I know that and you have to tell part of the story, like you're an MVP, then you weren't, then you're an MVP and how that plays with your emotions. I want to find out about that. Well, it's funny because I've been waiting today too, but I think because I was just reawarded in May, I don't think I get a, an update to my nomination at all. So no, you're just extra long until next year, but right. <laughs> so for folks that don't know you, who are you, where are you and what do you do? So I am J. Peter Brzezzi. I am located in uh, just near Orlando, Florida. And uh, I'm the chief evangelist for Clip Training, which is a company that I co-founded uh, some years ago. It's focused on creating uh, portals for organizations, partners, MSPs, and those portals are educational portals. So we have an employee training and enablement platform that they give to customers, and those customers give to all of their end users. And the content that we have in the platform is Microsoft 365 content, Copilot, Teams, and so forth, um, as well as all of the traditional Office apps, uh, Windows uh, 11 and down. Um, and then we also have content that revolves around security awareness and a variety of other topics. It's, so I, I interviewed um, uh, it, Peter, your, your uh, co-founder, uh, you know, so talked to, to Nick a um, couple episodes back, I think, as far as publishing dates. And uh, who's former MVP and talking about it. And I mentioned to him as well that it's funny talking to a few people about, um, so we're talking about before we started recording, that I'm going to self-pub a book next year. Um, Plan's been working on it for a couple of years. And I've had two people independently say, hey, you should talk to those clip training guys about what they do with ebooks and other stuff. Like, like you've done really well you know, with, with them. So, so Nick actually, so Nick and I, uh, we formed a company called Conversational Geek, and he handles that. That's the ebook side, right? Ah, okay. Um, but Nick is actually, uh, I guess we'd call him our director of marketing for clip training um, because there's synergy between the two. And so, even though I co founded that with Nick, because all of my energy needed to go toward clip training, um, Nick took Conversational Geek forward. I still work with him on that, but then he works with me on clip training, which I actually co founded with Tim Duggan. Um, actually many years ago, our business has evolved and changed in the sense that originally it was just videos on Microsoft topics. And then as things evolved, we found that a, a platform was needed. Uh, there just seems to be a little bit of a gap in terms of the end user. As you know, a lot of organizations that I've worked for, probably you've worked for as well, uh, like train signal, plural site and so forth. Um, they're all about videos that uh, focus on IT, dev, or maybe extreme graphics, right? Not the, not the light stuff, but the heavier stuff. But the end user then gets ignored in the process. And, and we feel that, you know, that, that information needs to cascade down to the end user uh, because otherwise they won't adopt Microsoft solutions. It doesn't build confidence in them. When they have new things thrown at them every day, uh, they, they need to feel confident. Otherwise, what I find is that end users do today what they did yesterday. Uh, you can give them the new computer and all the latest Windows 11 and all the co-pilot and, and they'll just go, wait a minute, wait a minute. How do I do my job today the way I did it yesterday? Yeah. Um, which that allows them to survive. But if you've really bought into the idea that they need these new tools to thrive going into 21st century communication and collaboration, then it does them no justice to just give them those tools. Yeah. Uh, they may, there, there are always going to be those few who they champion those things. They, they dive right in. But the majority are just going to either allow their fears of something new or, or simply the fact that they don't see the value to hold them back. So with clip training, we focus on getting those users to move forward, to trust and build confidence in what Microsoft is, is promoting because we feel it really is going to transform the way that they work. So anyway, that's that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> well, that's, you know, it's interesting though about this. We've had this conversation about like the evolution of a lot of community events. I know that you've spoken at a lot of events and you've helped you know, organize things over the, over the years. And uh, I mean, when I used to be very involved in um, like the Western US, the SharePoint Saturday movement, all these events, all of these cities. And I, I was living in Seattle and flying to speak at events in the East Coast in Europe and occasionally down in Asia Pacific. I'm like, why are we not having these on the Western US? And so actually helped start or I started myself 
several different cities and built up contacts for those those events. What's interesting to look over the last 15 years that I've been involved in these various community events is that initially they were very dev and uh, IT pro focused, very little end user content. And as those platforms as SharePoint and then Teams and kind of all these other categories of technology, Power Platform now, Copilot, all the AI stuff, it's really been trending more towards the end user side of it at those sessions that I... I, like the one of the dangers is that like for MVPs is that we're all technologists. We're excited about new things. We all want to go and talk about and present on the new stuff, which is usually on the more technical, the depth side of that. And we tend to forget the needs of the the end users. And so that there's a, I mean, there's there's a never ending flow of new end users many of which that don't have any technical skills other than PowerPoint, Word, Excel, email, you know, that's like the, their world. And so to, to help them, you know, in all of these categories, I think there's plenty of room for anybody to go in and say, Hey, I'm, I'm more of a power user of these things. I can create content for the community around this and start speaking and writing and creating videos and other things. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's interesting the way uh, I've evolved in my career as a result of this this shift. Um, so when I first started, I was all about Active Directory. Uh, back with the release of, I was an NT 4.0 MCSC, and then Active Directory came out in Windows 2000. And uh, I wrote books on Active Directory for Coriolis and Cybex and such. Um, and, and I was a server guy. And then I moved into Exchange Server, um, primarily because all my friends had all the other subjects kind of locked down. <laughs> yeah. So I said, what's left? They said, exchange. I said, I'll take it. So uh, I would speak at Tech Mentor and other events, Ignite, um, all about exchange. Uh, and, and then uh, that morphed into being awarded as an MVP. I was originally awarded for Microsoft Exchange. Um, and then that lasted for a few years until Office 365 came out. And then I got switched over to the Exchange Online side, to the Office 365 apps and services. So for about eight years, uh, eight times I was awarded an MVP. And then my work life just sort of took over. There was so much work. I was traveling like yourself, traveling all over. Um, I ended up not making enough contributions to get rewarded back in 2019. So I had a five-year gap there. During that time, my focus shifted more towards M365, but less towards the exchange side, more towards the end user side, um, especially with clip training, the focus being on not just end users, but on, like you had mentioned, power users who I find more and more, we're, we're getting into a world where um, you have these non-IT admins that are running M365 platforms. Um, maybe they farm it out to their MSPs, but in other cases, maybe they handle it in-house. And so you have this group of people, and maybe it's just my age, you know, our age, right? Um, there's this group of people who have never had to plug in an Ethernet cable They've never had to install Exchange Server or Server, you know, uh, whatever flavor of it um, on an actual server. Um, everything is cloud-based, everything, and that's what they know. Yeah. And so, uh, and even with SaaS services, that's what they know. So, uh, unfortunately, they're missing some of the underlying technology, uh, like how does DHCP really work? What is DNS? Uh, th those are still valid things, Active Directory, and then, of course, porting it over to, you know, Azure's Entra and how that works and what does that really mean? What is directory services? That's an education they don't have. Yeah. And I think that's where I'm focusing today. That's where I'm focusing a lot of my energy on the end user side, tools like Copilot, Teams, OneDrive, SharePoint. And then on the other side, the non-IT admin side, the modern admin that, you know, really, if I can bolster some of their knowledge, uh, the things that they haven't learned because they never needed to, but it, mm -hmm. it's still valid. I've been working on that, writing articles about that and such. And so it's it's been fun to see over the course of, I mean, it's been I don't know, 25 years now and to see the my career path you know shift and morph but stay within that education space mm -hmm. um you just roll with what education is most valuable at any given moment in time and uh so yeah it's this is an exciting time i think you know as an as a re-awarded mvp and finding what all my other mvp friends are, are doing now how they've evolved as well i mean i've watched some of them but i lost track of a few so it's kind of exciting to catch up with with some of my old friends and it is a lot of change it's in, in fact i was just commenting there's a group of us that are mvps so i'm a, a aviva explorer for those that don't know it's, it's a bunch of mvps that have focused very much on the employee experience 
solutions and Microsoft Viva that, you know, the branding of that pulling together the various products within that space. Um, and a lot of us came from more social collaboration, uh, you know, background. Um, and my, my experience in that space goes back to the late nineties. Um, and so it wasn't just like with, you know, Yammer, the, in that acquisition, you know, right. uh, 11, 12 years ago. Um, but we're talking about how all of us that are, you know, uh, like the official title of our MVP category is the M365 MVPs. Yet within that, that Microsoft is really calling out and recognizing the differences. Like I was just awarded in two subcategories of SharePoint and Microsoft Teams, because that's where the bulk of my stuff goes. I talk a lot about AI. Not I talk more about AI broadly than I do about Copilot because Copilot's still pretty immature where, where it is for the overall space that AI stuff has been around for a long time. Um, but, you know, looking at the, the, all of the contributions. So I have people that I thought were doing the exact same stuff. Somebody else got theirs in Viva and stream somebody else on SharePoint and Copilot and like the mixture of different things that are out there. It goes back to what you said. I mean, there's, there's so much opportunity to go and find and define your own space. It's kind of funny. You're, footprint. you're talking about these things and I'm thinking if I were to be, you know, awarded into a, a new space, right? What would it be? Um, I'm spending a lot of time on Copilot, but oddly enough, I'm also spending a lot of time these days talking about ClipChamp, um, yeah, which, yeah. Uh, you know, I, that happens sort of organically. Um, I've played with it initially when Microsoft acquired it and pulled it in. And then I went to a session at the Microsoft Community Conference down here in Orlando, uh, which I'm excited for the next one. I think the next one's in Vegas next year. And I saw a session on ClipChamp and I was like, ooh, they've come a long way, especially the premium version. And uh, started to mess with that. Now, it's not as far as Camtasia yet. Camtasia is still my primary tool for creating sure. videos. but um, And certainly not as far as things like DaVinci Resolve. Or, uh, mm -hmm. but, but I'm really excited with what they've got there. I really feel like a lot of my personal customers, partners and such, um, when they're looking to just create a video and they're maybe a little nervous about using something as sophisticated as Camtasia or, or DaVinci, they can use ClipChamp to create this. So I'm thinking, okay, I keep talking about this thing one of these days and there is no clip champ bucket yet, but if there is one, that's where I'll end up. I think. <laughs> well, there was a, uh, you know, cause you remember a few years back, cause you're right. I mean, it, and things shift and change. You may remember there was the, the Microsoft had their slate of tools where they're trying to go after the Adobe cloud crowd, Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, with those. And it was, I mean, nothing is, was as powerful as what Adobe offers around you know, Photoshop and the other, other stuff that are out there. Um, but they had those products, which the expression, the expression suite, if you remember right. that. Yep. And, and so things like that happen. I think that there's actually, I don't want to misspeak here, but that there's actually talk about creating a bucket for ClipChamp and things like that. But, uh, you know, because you never know, like, so a good friend of mine, Jonathan Weaver just got earned his MVP earlier this year. Uh, and so his, I think he's a business applications MVP, but he always uh, uh, touted the fact that he was the unofficial whiteboard MVP. And we all kind of laugh, but it's one of these tools that it's like the notepad MVPs that are out. Right, right. You know, no, whiteboard's it, actually pretty cool. I saw Heather Severino do a demonstration. So Heather Severino and I, she's over in uh, the Daytona area. We formed an uh, Orlando user group, uh, Microsoft 365 user group, uh, earlier this year. And at the very first in-person group, she did a presentation on Whiteboard. It blew me away, right? That, I mean, I was like, really? This? I, I thought it was kind of funny. And then she showed me how she could use Copilot in Whiteboard. And yep. um, anyway, she's an amazing instructor. Great, great job, MVP. Um, and so, yeah, you're right. Whiteboard, you, you might th not think that's a... Uh, that should be a bucket, I think, especially well, as they evolve it. It's one of those things where Jonathan, like when he got it, he reached out to them and he said, he's like unofficial. I said, I'm still going to claim that I was the original, you know, the whiteboard MVP. And I'm like, hey, go claim the space. Right. But, I mean, fair. the point is, you know, is like finding that footprint, finding the other piece. I mean, the other thing you brought up a point before we were started recording here, which uh, as I mentioned, I talked with every one of my customers around is that we're not, um, people don't, do enough with the content they've already created to get that out into different channels. And that's, that's another thing. I mean, I know, so again, you understand that you do that. I do that as well. I might reformat it, refactor it is the, I, I say, I create variations on that piece. But the idea is that I go create a, 
like a long white paper or an ebook or a series of articles that are, you know, otherwise, you know, it's a, it's one long, could be a book. Um, but I'm, I'm breaking up these pieces, but then I think about what could I do video? What could I do with podcasts? What could I do with live events? What could I do from a, from a social campaign, you know, perspective if get more out of that. And I think if more people understood that, I think that they would double or triple the, the volume of contributions in the, the, the categories. I agree. I think there's a, a few reasons for this. First of all, uh, different people learn in different ways, right? Yep. And then different people uh, spend time on different platforms. So you still have your Twitter X, you know, users. Um, so if you put something out on that platform, maybe it's a little shorter, but there's, you're going to have an audience there, but they may not be your YouTube audience. They may not be your LinkedIn audience, right? You need to look at not just, uh, sometimes it's okay to put the same content in multiple locations to hit all of your audience points. Sometimes it's okay to put different types of that content in those different buckets because it's meant to be a different medium. So when you try to put, you know, uh, I, I feel when you try to put a, a, let's say a TikTok video on YouTube, it, it may not feel like it's the right, you know, switch. You should keep your TikTok type content you know, your cell phone long ways content on TikTok and maybe uh, go with something a little more uh, substantial, a little longer on YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. And try to work that way. Um, maybe things that are a little less uh, business oriented, you keep on your, uh, your social media sites as opposed to your business social media like LinkedIn. Sometimes I find that they cross paths and that's okay sometimes. Other times I feel like, okay, this content probably doesn't belong on LinkedIn. It might belong on Twitter. And so you can, like you said, you can write something and, and people may not have time to read all of that. So if you can break it down into chunks and release it as 15 different other things, you get a lot more runway out of that content. And and it's it's not duplicitous. You're not trying to pretend that you, you've done 15 things, but you're basically making it so that everyone can appreciate what you've created in the the, the bite-sized pieces you, you ultimately release. The other thing is that in the day of uh, uh, you know, the era of AI around that, it's not you're not just taking something and having AI go and generate. It could certainly give you ideas to split that out, to do something different, to to say, hey, give it instructions. Like, here's something I wrote. I've done this where I said I wrote this for my blog, where it's a much more casual tone. It's it's much personal. I'll share other stories and things. But I'll, I can go and dump that into AI and say, hey, I want to create a variation of this over for LinkedIn that focuses more around these three areas of this. And, you know, what do you, what do you suggest of this? What, what would you do to edit this? You know, uh, anyway, that, that's a great way to leverage the tools yes. to go yep. and format it for those different audiences. I agree 100%. You know, I recently used Copilot to help me with a presentation. I gave a presentation last month at uh, Microsoft's offices in Times Square. And the whole point of the presentation was to explain how it was a two day event um, with um, TD Cynix and Microsoft promoting Copilot education. Mm -hmm. And it, the real goal was Copilot confidence uh, to increase the confidence. So I spoke about um, the value of making sure your end users get that cascading waterfall of education, right? That it can't just go from Microsoft to MSPs, and then they're supposed to reach out to their customers, and then it ends there. Why? Because the customers, as long as they purchase Copilot, you know, it's a win back up the chain. It's not a win, because unless those customers now help their end users to adopt the Copilot solution, to really see the value in it, trust it, and then have confidence in it themselves, if that confidence doesn't cascade down, well, then it's not going to work because eventually they're going to turn off their co-pilots. They're, uh, you know, you, they're going to turn off licenses. Money will be lost eventually, right? Yeah. So it's not, for me, it's not about money. It's about, do you really believe in this solution? And I do, I really do believe this is going to transform the way we work. So um, I spoke about this and then I said, you know, I feel it was good, you know, and it was fun to be in Times Square, Microsoft, and it was a great audience. But I said, I can do better here. There's, there, I'm missing something. So I fed it all into Copilot, and I said, can you help me to illustrate this better? And wow, the response that I got from Copilot, it took all of my thoughts and words and it put it into something that was a lot more, you know, a lot easier to digest 
And it gave me the idea for uh, for an illustration where I'm using floating islands and cascading waterfalls. Uh, and oddly enough, it wasn't able to actually give me the graphic for that because designer still still has some glitches with a little bit of hallucination in, in yeah. what you ask for. Yep. But the the verbal aspect of it was fantastic. And I was able to give that to a graphics artist and get back. So now I have two more of these events coming up in DC and then in uh, and then in Chicago. And I have this whole new deck that includes this new graphic and this new set of illustration, thanks to Copilot. Yeah. So yeah, we do need to use Copilot. I mean, if, you know, I recommend for everybody to use it, not to write their content, but to help enhance it, right? Get them to the next level. Yeah. There's a, I, and one other question, again, you, we, you had kind of, you know, talked around it, um, or you said early in your, your experience with picking up exchange, um, looking at the landscape now in the space. And, and I mean, there's always, if somebody, you could have a densely packed area. We have a lot of MVPs in this area. A lot of people writing about talking about that aren't MVPs. Like, do we need more content in that area? My argument is always like your voice, your perspective is going to be different from everybody out there. Like, don't stop yourself from writing about talking about, you know, things that you're passionate about just because there's a lot of other people in that area. But um, especially for people that might be interested in becoming an MVP and be a lot of people that watch this series that are interested to get different perspectives on that. Do you have any areas that you think that there we are lacking as a MVP community? Do you think that there are opportunities that you don't see people stepping into that people should go take a look at it? I do. I think it goes back to what I was saying with the non-IT admin or the modern admin. I feel like sometimes um, when you're trying to uh, Im impress an audience, uh, maybe you're, go you're thinking to become an MVP or to be respected in this category that I'm trying to promote myself in, I need to come up with something crazy awesome. I need to have something super technical. I need to come up with a PowerShell script that nobody's seen before. And if you can do that, that's fantastic. Great. Because it is needed. That's, that's, a, that's a definite need if you're that level of technical, you know, uh, you know brilliance. But there's such a gap with the modern uh, admin that anything you can provide where you speak in a conversational way to them, where your goal is not to try to, you know, if they walk away from something you've written or said, and they say, wow, you're really smart, you, you've, you've wasted it. An MVP is not supposed to impress everybody with how smart they are. The goal should be to help the community, assist the community. Mm -hmm. So if the community needs you to make something more conversational, which is, is really where, where Nick and Conversational Geek, that's their whole focus. Make it so that a subject matter expert is talking, not down, but talking across to a person at their level and helps them to get to the next level and makes it so that now they can turn around and have a conversation with someone else. That is really interesting to me. And that's the way I write now. It used to be I would write and I'd have an editor. When I wrote for InfoWorld, I wrote the Enterprise Windows column for about a decade. My editor used to make me sound really smart. And I love that. But I realized that I don't need to sound really smart. Um, not that I, I don't want to sound dumb either, but, but, but what I really need to sound is genuine. Yeah. And I really need to convey genuine information of value to, uh, to those folks who need it. So my feeling on that is find uh, the subjects you love and then try to teach it to others who are nowhere near your level. Don't worry about impressing your fellow MVP peers who are probably not gonna read your content anyway. They're so busy doing their own thing. Uh, don't try to impress with how deep you are. Instead, focus on where the audience is. And right now we have a lot of these new you know, admins who really could use the bolstering underneath, really could use the understanding as to how all of these things really work uh, going back to the old days, especially if you've been around for a while. Yeah. Um, if you haven't, and let's say you also have those gaps, then I would say bolster yourself on those gaps first, but also then repeat what you're learning, you know, rinse and repeat, get it into your mind as, like, for young, younger generation, figure out how these things you used to work, how they work now and share that with your people so that we all kind of advance together. That's, I mean, that may sound a little bit, you know, pie in the sky, but well, that's my advice. That's really well, I think, my advice. I like practically speaking too, like I've never been one of these people that when I write content, I don't go look and say, oh, what does SEO tell me? Like what do it, what topics do I need to hit? Like that, right. like I don't, I, I look what's I'm like, oh, that's interesting, but I don't go and create new content based on, oh, I'm getting the most traffic in this topic. You know, and let me go write more of that kind of content. I mean, that's a strategy. I'm not trying to talk people out of that, but that's not my focus. 
but I love going looking for patterns in uh, various forums. And you know, what, what questions are people getting hung up on that I could be like, hey, I know the answer to that. Um, that's a great way to go and find like where there might be gaps, especially what you're talking about. There's technical documentation for this stuff. One, can they find it? Two, is it the right level to, that they can actually understand and, and use that? And so sometimes being that translator of that more complex, the formal documentation's there, but there's a disconnect. Let me help decipher this for real people in, the, in this role. I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, there's a huge need for that. Yep. And for those kinds of sessions as well. I mean, again, I go to keep going to events and it, 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 we seem to be getting into, an, uh, uh, again, another era, another wave of more deeply technical and we're leaving behind a lot of the, the fact that a lot of folks coming in are like, this is their only outside work, their first time getting any kind of training, uh, you know, deeper training around this. And they need to be kind of baby stepped through that. I agree hundred percent. But I, I know there's a lot we could go into and talk around on that topic, but I always like to end out. So folks that want to reach out to you, Peter, and find you, where are you most active in social? Where can people find you? You know, these days, everything's on LinkedIn. So uh, I, I spend most of my time on LinkedIn when I want to connect with people. Um, and anyone can reach out to me there. I typically accept all requests and, and any questions that you have, you can reach out to me there. You can also reach me through email. Um, I'm, I'm still a legacy email guy, so <laughs> that hasn't gone away yet. So uh, jpb at cliptraining.com. You're welcome to reach out to me and ask me any questions. Um, yeah, happy to talk. Awesome. Well, of course, we'll have all of uh, his contact information in the blog and on the on YouTube and as well as on the podcast. So thanks so much for your time. It's great seeing you again. I'm sure I'm going to see you two or three more times this year. At Absolutely. Events. It's going to happen. So thanks a lot for your time. Good to be with you. Wow.